phantom, must never have an accident in their life. But sometimes they do happen. I'm still human. Um, and I'm joined by some awesome humans as we bring you this very special edition of the Hood Wazi, brought to you in conjunction with UIC's Fresh Water Lab as we celebrate art, water, activism, and the Chicago motherfucking river. Let's give it up for the river. This is a mess. This wind is just blowing everything away. So, um, we are going to kick this day off with our first panel uh, over the next two days. Uh, this panel uh, is a conversation on the politics and big business of exploiting our river. If we're going to reimagine our water and our relationship to the waterways of Chicago, it's important to understand what we're up against and being able to carve out a new world for those waters. Today, I said water a lot in those couple of sentences. I'm not sure if it made sense, but I'm guessing it did. Let's introduce our panelists today. So joining me um, are some brilliant humans with a range of uh, experience in organizing academia, politics, the arts, and more. Um, I'll let them quickly go around and introduce themselves uh, with their uh, name, pronouns, and what organization they're repping. How about you start us off, Teresa? Hello, everybody. Big shout out to you. Teresa Cordova, she, her, director of UIC's Great Cities Institute. Uh, Byron Sicho Lopez, uh, uh, alderman of the 25th Ward, and prefer pronouns he, him, and it's great to be here with you all. Thank you. Wow, this politician is reckless, taking his mask off in public. Someone take a picture. Take a picture, send it to the Tribune. And next we have... <laughs> My name is Yana Kalminka. I'm the director of the Labor and Environmental Justice Department at Warehouse Workers for Justice in Will County, Illinois. Oh, and she and they pronouns. Thanks. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, Edith Tovar with the Little Village Environmental Justice Organization, a senior just transition community organizer, and my preferred pronouns are she and they. River. Like this boathouse wasn't even here until relatively recently, right? It's a recent development. When we think about the rapid development that's happening along the river, oh my, it's a lot. Thank you. No, I got it. <laughs> um, when considering the kind of the rapid transformation that's taking place along the Chicago River, what are some of the major issues that in your work you all see emerging? So the first thing we need to do is we need to clean up the water. It's contaminated, it's been contaminated, and as one of the things that I hope as there's more of a push for recreation, that there is also then a push for cleanup. Well, there's a, there's a where to start. There's so many issues. This is not only the Chicago River, it's the Gallupin River. Indigenous communities have a lot of issues. They're stopping pipelines uh, to protect the water. I think that what we need is, of course, Look at the inequalities, right? Because people of color, if you look at the issues in the southeast side, here in Pilsen, access to the river uh, is not always equitable. And in fact, very rarely is equitable. So what we see, we still have, need to have access and on the other side of the river, just right here. But also, how do we regulate and transform industrial corridors to make sure that our rivers don't get impacted so that we have actual sustainability? So from the regulation, the re in our industrial corridors to really protect the water. I think water, water you know, oftentimes is taken for granted, but it's a, it is a, a natural resource that is limited and we need to protect it. Yeah, I think um, I have a really interesting understanding of the river as it relates to warehousing and um, the goods movement industry, which basically in its modern form, uh, formed right alongside the Chicago River. I'm not going to walk you through all the dates just uh, to keep my answer kind of brief, but I think um, looking at worker exploitation as warehousing and distribution has developed alongside the river, as well as environmental injustice and environmental racism, and both of those two things happening as 
products of the exploitation caused by big business and a lot of the time the same exact corporations um, is, is the way that I would answer that question. So I think early on we had rail workers uh, experiencing really similar issues along the river as uh, warehouse workers experience today, including temporary employment models, low wages, uh, poor access to unions, right? But we also saw massive resistance coming out of those worker movements and standing up for both better conditions, but also the huge capacity that workers in this region have to stand up for protecting environmental resources through withholding their labor, which is some of the kind of largest power we have. I thought your answer was going to be brief. <laughs> <laughs> I had a whole timeline prepared, so I spared you a lot. <laughs> I want to hear it, actually. <laughs> we I wanna, will get yeah, there. I want to know those things. <laughs> Um, a little bit of the work um, that El Bejo has been doing in the Little Village Industrial Corridor um, is bringing up a lot of the points right, that Teresa, Byron, and Yana have made is that um, through the planning process that Chicago has somewhat established, right, um, residents are completely neg neglected and ignored when uh, residents and neighbors come up with their own solutions as far as like what are some things that we want to see in, in the industrial corridor. For example, um, when the Vita Park uh, park was established, um, you know, across the street, it's um, a not a lot of folks know about this body of water, which is the collateral channel, um, also known as Ass Creek, right, in the community because it smells so bad, because there has been uh, so much dumping happening in that area, right? And so what are some of the solutions that community residents are trying to bring up is not so much recreational, right? Not so much as that we need access to this water right now, but what are some industries that can be brought to the community to continue uh, building um, our close, uh, uh, economy, right, so that we can provide uh, closer jobs to neighborhoods, um, ways to lower emissions, right, because we know right now that a lot of uh, warehousing that is happening, it's happening in the suburbs, that, you know, that those products are being brought in. Um, warehousing is intense labor, and so on, what we are trying to do is trying to figure out how do we link these Right? How do we continue to engage community to see um, what are some visions and plans that they want to see in their community, but at the same time, how are we bringing those jobs and how are we improving job conditions that are currently within the Little Village Industrial Corridor? So that's just a little bit of what we're just doing. A just bit. a little bit. Save some for the show, Edith. <laughs> <laughs> like, all right, let's dig in. Let's dive in a little bit more into like particulars, right? So I think, Teresa, uh, Teresa, on your work as the director of the UIC Great Cities Institute, what is your focus in uh, research and practice around the ways development has impacted equity and access to our water in Chicago? Thank you. So one of the things I think we need to do is start with the history of Chicago, even, and the relationship of Chicago uh, to its waterways. So um, not only do we have rivers, but we have canals. And one of the, th one of the uh, sort of a framework for even how these, how these canals and, uh, got set up is, is the old um, uh, is the old portages, for example, from Native Americans, and, and so they were they became connectors, and so almost from the get go, um, first of all, the Na indigenous folks here used it as trade routes, right, and, and they did use it as a mode of transportation, but once once they uh, Chicago then became in incorporated as a city, we know, for example, between that period, let's say of the 18, 1840, 1850, all the way to the 1900, Chicago was probably one of the fastest growing cities in the whole world. And not only did it did it um, it grow, but it grew really intensely rapid. So, and one of the reasons that it grew is because of its strategic location, with respect to these waterways. Uh, but then, as these waterways as distribution points, which explains a lot even today, right? Why we're still this major hub, um, and why, for example, the warehouse work is, is is such critical, such a critical issue uh, for, to be attended to as the logistics industry expands. But um, not to belabor that this is too long, but but to but to make the point that that it, with it being so rapid, there wasn't a, much attention early on placed on infrastructure, um, there, you know, including wastewater treatment, for example. So the rivers even start being used for our wastewater. Um, and um, Can, when you say wastewater, what what does that entail? Um, I, I'll tell you what the first word that came to my mind was, but I don't want to say. <laughs> 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 
Right. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> yeah. one of the, one of the one of the basic aspects of of, uh, of of human settlements, right, is how do we deal with our with our human waste? And one of the ways that it got dealt with is dumping it in the in the river systems and in the waterways, right? Both in the canals after they got built and and the river itself. Um, and of course, you know about the reversing of the of the river uh, and and the, and what that meant in terms of of all this waste that was going not only the human waste but then the, all the industrial waste that was going into the canals that was then taken into the Mississippi River, which then of course we're not the only big city that dumped into that uh, into that river, but we are a major contributing factor to the dead zone down in the Gulf of Mexico. But the point I want to make is that it's been part of our history that and part of why we developed as rapidly as we did and the way that we did is because of our location and then our location as it, as it related to industrial development. So what, you started happen, what started happening in that whole period is all this industrial activity all along the river. And at that point, there, was no, no, there were no controls, there was no regard for the environment, there was just all this incredible amount of dumping. And so that's the, that's the legacy, right, of this area. And so of all of, of the you know, parts along the river. And uh, initially, a lot of the people who worked in these areas were white working class, uh, a lot of, you know, some of the early Latino communities as well. But then once there was a white flight, one of the things that happened, and partly largely due to the real estate industry, making certain areas available to us and other areas not available to us, we were sort of pushed into these areas where all this contamination exists. Um, and, then, and then it became sort of like, well, let's just keep that contamination there. So that's sort of the background backdrop for answering your direct question, which is what is Great Cities done? Um, I want to refer you to our website uh, to, if you go under practice and go down to participatory planning and over to the Calumet region and then over uh, down there, you'll see something called the Calumet uh, Planning Framework. Um, and this is something uh, that we uh, did in, in uh, cooperation with uh, a number of the community groups down there and community residents. And one of the things we do is we identify in there uh, a lot of, first of all, there's kind of, a, there's a historical stuff, there's demographic profile, but there's a lot of identity on what are some of the environmental contaminants that are down there. Um, and the timeline of not only when there was efforts to contaminate more, but what has been the resistance. So all of our history isn't just the history of contamination, it's also the history of resistance. And so that timeline lays, lays out uh, how important resistance has been to make that area from being even worse, which is why uh, resistance today is so important, because it can and, and does make a difference. So I could later go into more detail about the KDM and the nickel and all of that and its public health impacts, but I'll just stop with that. Well, I'm, I'm Hello? Okay. Well, I'm interested because I think one of the things when we talk about like these waterways and we're like, oh yeah, you know, we need to like fix the river because it's affecting us, it, it impacts our health or, you know, but I don't really think that necessarily people understand how yeah, you're or right. what, what impacts us, right? So like in, when we talk about the Chicago like river or, or, you know, the Calumet River or, or Lake Michigan, what are ways in which our actual physical health is directly impacted by some of the contamination that you've been discussing? So people in that area, probably in the southeast side I'm talking about, along the Calumet River, they probably have, um, based on what we were able to assess, uh, a, a lifespan four years lower uh, than, than people who don't live in that area. And if, if things like manganese, the cadmium, the nickel, um, the lead, all those kind, all that kind of exposure has impact on on asthma, cancer, other respiratory diseases. Um, and so there is data showing showing that there are toxic substances that are emitted from those from those chemicals um, that leach into the soil, that leach into the water, that that, that are in the air, um, and those are the things that people are, are are breathing. And I know, like for example, in the case of like El Rejo, one of the things that they're concerned about is all the truck traffic that's related to um, to some of this industrial activity and what that means in terms of the impact on for them on respiratory conditions as well. So. So yeah, it does, and there's data that shows it. I mean, there, there's a direct connection, and so people's health is direct, directly affected. It's clearly a public health issue. Um, let's move on, and speaking of vibrant and kind of some of these public health issues, uh, you're on city council trying to do something, good luck. Um, <laughs> and so when we talk about kind of 
Chicago and being on city council, right? I think like when we talk about our aldermen, I'm like, yes, I need a motherfucking garbage can. Please cut down this tree that's in the way, but I don't say that because it's not environmentally friendly. Take it back, strike that from the record. Um, but, you know, I don't think that we think about so much that aldermen are actually legislative positions as well um, that actually have a really big impact, uh, both in like not just the individual wards, but how they vote and what they, you know, individually and collectively on city council that ends up affecting our lives. Um, and so even when we think about kind of the, the waters and um, the waters of the city and kind of the environmental issues that are confronting us, what are some of the things that you are advocating for um, and that you see kind of happening in the city, in your community, and um, how are you kind of confronting those issues? Yeah, no, and, and uh, certainly I think that is a very important point. Uh, oftentimes I think that uh, in the council, not many older persons see themselves as legislators other than just service providers. But one of the main responsibilities as legislators is to re regulate some of this industry and to make sure that we provide quality care. Regulators! <laughs> so, Warren G. <laughs> yes. Oh, you, whatever word you prefer. But I do think that the, the legislation... Now I got that song in my mind. <laughs> But I think it's critical that, that we look at you know what happened. I think what, what Teresa was mentioning is very important. Look at the history of environmental racism in the city, and that has continued right over uh, even into recent history in the middle of a pandemic. So when we see the cases of Hilco, for instance, when we see the cases of General Iron, the history continues and continues. And who are affected are the most vulnerable communities. Well, communities where we have many essential workers communities where we have a lot of devastation because of the COVID, well, almost 6,000 uh, people, mainly in black and brown neighborhoods, have died of this pandemic, on top of the, the pandemic of violence. So if you add to this the, the environmental conditions, you see some, some really damaging and concerning factors. Uh, I tell you just a few that we are concerned about. The fact that in industrial corridors, right now at least we want to be notified when things are happening, but we have not gained something that is common sense, which is the right of communities to have a voice, to have a, a community meeting, to have impact studies before decisions are made. It is so devastating to see decisions that are made when we know the impacts are gonna have in our community. Today, to this day, we have not gained uh, self-determination of community control over those decisions, which is important. Right now, a lot of these decisions, when it comes to permits, when it comes to approvals, is still go to the Zoning Board of Appeals, which is a bureaucratic body in downtown that does not have the capacity to oversight or even have an opinion on some of these matters. So I think those are some of the things that we're concerned about, that before projects come to our community, we need to have some discussion and assessment of what's going on. Assessments are critical. The other thing that we have been discussing, and we have a recent meeting with the Region 5 of the EPA, is to discuss air monitoring, right? And, and how we can, how to monitor this situation and also the air quality and the water quality in our communities. Some of the some of the things that, that that we see is that even federal agencies or state agencies don't don't are not in um, in the position to make some basic regulations so that we see what's happening. I'll tell you some of the things that we see though. However, in the facts in our communities, there's a recent study at UIC. Dr. Kalas has shown the correlations of some serious damaging uh, cognitive development uh, effects in our children because of proximity to industrial corridors. Those are mainly schools that are in our communities because of the proximity. I'll give you an example, just a few, um, not even a mile away from here, with Perez Elementary, which where the Fisk uh, plan was still open, we have kids that tested positive in lead. The effects that they had, the long permanent effects that that has in our effect needs to be oversight and we need to be sure that the acceptable rate is zero lead contamination. We're gonna be seeing pretty close or pretty soon the results of this lead oversight. But I tell you that our kids right now and our future, our present and future is a risk if we don't take proper measures. So we are concerned about these studies and what we do about it, making sure that these studies are taken seriously, not as recommendations, but as urgent as urgent calls to take action so that we prevent more damage in our kids. This is a permanent damage that we that we have in our community. The oversight again, as we see, and the last thing that we like to say is that we're talking about not only re-envisioning industrial corridors, because right now it is incredible that we see in the case of General Iron, when we relocate a whole uh, metal shredder facility to a community that already has huge community effects on, on, uh, on pollution and quality and the effects that Teresa mentioned on the health in the middle of a pandemic, the health and well-being of our residents. I think it's fundamental right now that we re-envision industrial corridors to make greener corridors. We should be talking about putting thief money 
into re-envisioning our economy. We know that these, these, theory, these uh, uh, industries are obsolete. To continue to allow fossil industry or metal short of heavy industry close to proximity to in residential areas is criminal. It really is, because we know what's happening in the long run. We need to make sure that we put deep funding into incentivize uh, uh, green energy, green technology, for green jobs for the future. That's what's going to help not only to envision our economy, but have sustainable a long-term plan for our communities to be part of these changes and have a sustainable plan for the future. Climate change is a very real thing. I know some... No, it's not. No, it's not. Don't, <laughs> I know, don't be afraid. I know Republicans uh, and some corporate Democrats still are in denial, but I tell you that politicians are the first ones that need to take a serious crash course on basic environmental justice. Well, speaking of that, Byron, about politicians need to take a basic <laughs> crash course on environmental justice, you know, you've been using the word we a lot, and uh, speak for yourself, because some of us are all out here doing something, <laughs> but what I want to know is, because, you know, when we do talk about kind of making kind of change at a structural institutional level, right, a lot of us are forced to, um, a lot of us are alienated from that type of decision-making power, and presumably, right, aldermen, like yourself, are supposed to be taking care of it and operating in our best interest. So what do we do in a city like Chicago where we have a city council where the majority of the 50 aldermen on it operate in as a rubber stamp kind of um, committee for your best friend, Mayor Lori Lightfoot? <laughs> I, I don't know if she would take that as a, as a <laughs> best friend, but... <laughs> yes, but yeah, absolutely. I think that there is certainly uh, a culture of pay to play that we need to change. We've been taking a serious look into those practices, and we have even gone as far as we're taking some of these cases to the Supreme Court to change some of these court. Can you give us an example of some of that pay to play? So we've seen in the case of, of politicians to that and uh, former Speaker Madigan at the helm of it that have used even contributions to defend themselves into uh, court out of like those allegations of corrupt practices. That needs to change. We cannot allow those contributions to allow them to defend themselves out of that. They have to pay for them with their personal funds. But let me let me answer the, the most pressing question, which is what we can do. Because that's important. I think with Bejo and many other community groups have shown an example of what can, that can be done. When the case of Hilco came into our community, we were the first ones who opened up an investigation with Inspector General. That was fundamental to open up an investigation so that we have changes, immediate changes on these practices. That resulted in some changes on how these uh, implosions are conducted in our community. But to allow an implosion in the middle of a pandemic, the way it was done, it was not only disrespectful, but again, a criminal act on the little village community. I think that also what we need to make sure that we that, that we that we do is to take action when injustices are happening in our community. I really want to uh, commend the General Iron Strike hunger strikers for the fight to denounce the atrocity that was to relocate a, a facility from a north side affluent neighborhood to a poor, vulnerable uh, neighborhood that is already dealing with the community effects of pollution. The General Iron um, the strikers were courageous in their. Uh, in their actions, and only through that organizing effort and direct action, they were able to get the EPA to take another look into this, into something that was already being fast-tracked. The reason why we have able to stop that is because the, the courageous efforts of the General Iron hundred strikers. I decided to join that the last 10 days. I tell you, that's, that's the, one of the hardest things that I've done. I don't know how people were in thir doing almost 30 days. I did a 30-day juice fast, I, I, it's not that. I, I don't know. So if, if you put your mind to it, you can do it. <laughs> but I tell you, like, I did 10 days. Those are the hardest 10 days, psychologically, physically. So I just want to I, I just want to urge everyone into, yes, elected officials have to be held accountable. I think that we also need people to participate and be part of this movement for environmental justice. We have a sunrise movement that is full of young people. It's beautiful to see our young people to participate, but it's sad to see our elected officials ignore our young people, ignore our communities. So the direct action works, I think, for those who continue to ignore the direct action and the effectiveness of these actions. we got to take another look, but because I tell you, the EPA and many other places were not looking to this until there was a, 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 a hunger strike that resulted in now a full investigation and a legal action to stop them. So that, that is actually what works. The other thing that I'm concerned about is the uh, use of these polluters and industry of the judicial branch. That's what I want to uh, circle back to the importance of us to take action. One of the things that, uh, that we have seen at the interconnection of this global crisis, uh, right now as we speak, there's an environmental civil rights attorney that is being detained for 800 days in, um, in, uh, in his home 
for the only reason of holding Chevron accountable for the actions and the pollution in the Amazon in Ecuador. That is a fundamental attack on democracy when we have an attorney that was successful in holding a corporation like Chevron accountable, holding it accountable, winning a $9 billion settlement for the criminal act. There were thousands of people who were infected, they were died out of the pollution of the water. There were thousands of people that died of cancer because of the responsibility of oil spills of Chevron. We continue to see this, this industry to continue to act with impunity. We see recently the Calumet River. Again, the oil fossil industry could continue to pollute our rivers without any accountability. We need to make sure that we denounce that, we hold them accountable, and they, they got to pay reparations to our communities. But not only that, they have to be held accountable, and we need to protect democracy by protecting environmental justice advocates and civil rights lawyers who now, right now, are being retaliated against for the only reason of holding them accountable. Oil fossil industry now also is attacking indigenous communities because of the right to, de to denounce their atrocities. In, in industries that are completely obsolete. This is on our best interest to collaborate, participate, and denounce these actions. Thank you, Byron, for talking so much. That was a very thorough, <laughs> very, very thorough, thorough answer. We appreciate it, I swear. Um, but I think one of the things that both Byron and Teresa mentioned, right, was kind of the way, uh, the development that happened along the river. You heard certain key words like logistics, right, which refers to like kind of the warehousing industry that's kind of uh, blooming among other things. Uh, we also talked about the, uh, the, the environmental impacts, the negative environmental impacts that come with that kind of development and the communities that it affects. And so, Edith, I'm kind of interested because you, you know, you grew up on the south and west side precisely in these communities that are being affected. Um, and I'm interested in that. Can you speak to uh, some of the environmental uh, impact and damage that is happening, you know, along the river or in the city um, from the perspective of a resident? And how did that filter into your journey to the uh, work that you're doing? Yes. Um, don't do, don't pull a Byron. <laughs> it's 12.40. We are going 10 minutes over, but just, you know. This is, no, it's a politician. What is it not? Just like, <laughs> um, so, yes, I'll keep it short. Uh, <laughs> um, so I am a lifelong resident of the Little Village community. Um, I've always known Little Village as my home. Uh, when my family migrated, they actually migrated to the Tri-Taylor area, but with the expansion of UIC, um, my family was displaced, and so that's how we ended up in, in Little Village. Um, my family, my siblings, um, they have respiratory issues, and so living in Little Village has always been um, a, a, a unfortunate problem, right? Um, because we live in a very busy street um, that has seen an increase of diesel trucks throughout the years, uh, we know that unfortunately the air that we're breathing in is not uh, clean, it's not safe, uh, which is causing a lot of our young people um, that we have seen now with the limited data that exists in public health, right? Um, we know that a lot of our young people have respiratory issues and, you know, that generation is growing and so we are seeing an even more um, increased demand of uh, public health services in our community, which are already limited. Um, a little bit about Little Village, 40% uh, of our land use is dedicated for industry. So we're looking at close to 80,000 people that live within a five uh, square foot, uh, five square mile radius. So it's very condensed, very dense. And so when we're looking at industries that continue to operate, many that have been operating for over a century, right? We still don't know what's in the air. We still don't know what is, uh, what we're breathing. And so um, this is why El Mejo exists, um, because we are pushing for a lot of these industries to be held accountable, to update a lot of the machinery, right? To um, keep up with the times um, that we're trying to, to uh, create in a safer way. Um, one of the main things that we're pushing uh, within the Little Village Industrial Corridor is for, you know, th this supposedly green economy, right? That is being promised and has been promised to us. Um, and so one of the ways that we're, that we're doing that is that we have a solar for all training program is that we're already looking for programming, for um, opportunities for our young people and folks that are interested in that trade to look into, into these different opportunities. For example, right, the, the Hilco warehouse, um, the Exchange 55 warehouse shouldn't have happened at all because 
communities have a, and a lot of our residents and neighbors have already had laid out a plan of what we wanted to see right it could have been so amazing to have an indoor vertical farm right in in, in place of that warehouse um, I think I keep going back to a lot of the greenwashing um, language that they were using um, the largest lease certified solar panel you know in the city of Chicago Sorry to interrupt, does everyone know what greenwashing is break it down really quick yeah greenwashing is when uh, corporations mostly polluters use really fancy words like you know su sustainable uh, uh, water retention uh, uh, things right right so automatic lights they're gonna be turning off or you know when you're washing your hands the faucet's gonna turn off um, these are just like very generic like oh, okay that's great um, but you're still going this warehouse is still going to be bringing in about 400 to 700 diesel trucks in and out of our community, right? Those are 700 plus trucks that are going to be emitting um, uh, particulate matter that affects our most vulnerable communities. Again, these are young people, children, our elderly, our elders, right? Um, a lot of folks in, in Little Village don't really rely on cars. We walk everywhere because, you know, we, we need to go to the corner store, we need to go do our, our laundry, and so we walk. And so these are some of the things that are really um, scary for us knowing that this warehouse is already here it's operational um, there is still no information of, you know whatsoever as far as like is there going to be air monitoring when this uh, company came into our community the city nor the state mandated them to install air monitors so we didn't know what we were breathing while there was like this mantling of this 80 plus you know year old coal power plant right um, this uh, where this project could have been an opportunity for the city and for the state really to look at it as an example to work with community to figure out ways um, to for better planning but being our city being that money moves quicker right um, a, a lot of these decisions just happened overnight and our community was completely um, unaware of what are th these changes that were happening so a lot what we're doing now is that instead of like you know Yes, we're feeling some sort of defeated because we, we do see this warehouse um, in, in our community, but it's also an opportunity for us to think a little bit more creatively, right? Okay, so this Target warehouse is happening. How do we organize those 2,000 workers? Are these workers interested in becoming a union? If so, how do we support them? Because there are um, organizations in our community that do a lot of labor movements, right? And so, El Vejo um, in itself, we are particularly an environmental justice community, but we're also willing and down to support a lot of our our um, workers. And so, if you are a Target warehouse worker, connect with me. I will uh, connect you to other folks as well. This was like my shameless plug. <laughs> well, I want you to shameless plug something else. I think in your uh, pre-interview for this uh, panel, one of the things you brought up was the words clean tech. Yes. Can you talk to us about what that is briefly and what possibilities it engenders? Yeah, so... That sounded like, that sounded fancy. What possibilities does it engender? <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, green tech um, it is, is an opportunity for us to really um, take advantage of the current resources and the current funding that is happening right now. Um, you know, we just passed uh, CJA. It just changed its name. Um, Sorry, CJA, look, Google CJA, Illinois. Um, <laughs> it's a long acronym. Um, but you know, the, this, these are funding opportunities where we, we, we can um, look at for, I'm sorry, we can look at frontline communities like Little Village, like Pilsen, like the Southeast side, right? To ask current residents, okay, what are, what are the, the needs and, and skills that y'all have right now? For example, Little Village, we have a very large knowledge of, agri of agriculture skills, right? So an opportunity for us could have been to build, uh, with the support of green tech, green technology, right, to build vertical farming. We could have done, you know, growing year long. We could have supported a lot of the restaurants that are within the 26th Street, you know, um, economic corridor. We could have supplied a lot of those restaurants and a lot of those corners with fresh organic food, right? That's an opportunity. That's a way of That's work. not green tech, girl. That's not well tech. <laughs> well, it is what it is, right? It's supporting our residents and keeping uh, close, uh, you know, to keep jobs close to, to their community, lowering emissions again, right? Creating uh, uh, worker collaboratives, right? So that our own residents can really see their business grow 
from you know a seed to you know leading their their crops to the local restaurant or the local corner store. So I think one of the things that we've heard kind of re uh, reiteratively, even in the time that we've been out up here, is about the force of corporate interest in this landscape, right? Whether it's talking about the industrial corridors, whether it's talking about logistics, whether it's um, talking about the pay-to-play. Um, uh, trip from 60% of the entire continent. So when you start thinking about the increasingly, uh, you know, next day delivery, same day freaking delivery models that Amazon is trying to introduce and trying to push, this space is a place where they have to be, right? And that gives us as residents and as workers a tremendous amount of power here to address literally the richest people in the world, right? Uh, we're talking Jeff Bezos, we're talking Walmart and Ayers, and so, all that being said, I think kind of the strategy... He's in space. <laughs> he went Bezos to space. Is in space. He spent over $5 billion to go to space for like 10 minutes, by the way. Uh, and, then, and then thanked his workers for his ability to do that. Yes. His workers and his customers. Yeah, it's appalling. Um, but yeah, all that being said, I think workers and residents around industrial areas like this, including the south and west sides of Chicago, right, including the south suburbs like Will County, uh, where a lot of our warehouse workers are working right now. Um, residents, community members, and workers really need to stand shoulder to shoulder and leverage their strategic power to make demands that are pushing for environmental justice, right? Investment in communities instead of endless tax breaks for these corporations. Um, and of course, better treatment of workers and more access to organizing rights, right? In the job, uh, getting rid of temporary work structures that make it really easy to fire people who are really trying to take a stand and fight for better and more sustainable communities economically and environmentally. Um, and I think the other piece that I wanted to touch on is organize your workplace, right? <laughs> um, I think in a world, to Byron's point, where, um, you know, where we're doing a lot of fighting on the ground to try to weed corporate money out of politics, but honestly, a lot of the time, and I, I hate coming at it from a place of, of a lack of power, right? But, like, corporations will beat us every time in court. They'll beat us every time with donations, right? And so how do we build alternative structures and forms of power, specifically in places like on the job, right? Where you can make their pockets hurt and that's what they really care about, right? And that's how we can really try to hold these corporations accountable in a way that's not going through systems that have been historically and traditionally designed for corporations instead of working class people. They're people too. <laughs> corporations are people too, yes, yeah, it's united. <laughs> Thanks to Citizens United. Can you give us a quick example of, of, a, of a success story around the, along those lines? Great question. Uh, fun fact is that we are pretty sure that Warehouse Workers for Justice is the first worker center in the country that's doing really uh, work at the intersection, like very intentionally having a department of environmental justice and worker justice work. Short answer is... Wow, the first. Yana is feeling herself. Let's give it up. We're, we're figuring it out. <laughs> But I think, I think about something like um, in the south suburbs, there's a huge fight around uh, saying no to North Point. So North Point is a proposed uh, intermodal development that would be between Elwood and Joliet that would bring about 3,000 acres more of warehousing and logistics space to the community that's already overburdened with tens of thousands of trucks a day, diesel pollution, et cetera, and low quality jobs. And I think the really interesting thing there is that they've been fighting to come to this community 
community that's been adamantly saying, no, we don't want you here for over three years now. And the language they use is, but we're bringing, you know, 10,000 good jobs. We're bringing well-paying jobs to your community. And I think the really unique space of worker organizing for environmental justice allows working class people to say, actually, these jobs, can I curse? These jobs fucking suck, right? <laughs> Um, these jobs suck and actually they're not bringing a benefit to our community and especially over COVID we've seen that um, that warehousing specifically was the second hardest hit industry in Illinois by COVID right and so I think everyone that I work with directly who's a warehouse worker has experienced tremendous loss this year um, and it really shows how unsafe the workplaces are and how easy it is to fire workers who have been standing together to demand safer working conditions under COVID um, and so all that being said, I think the Nota North Point fight is a really interesting model of people who ostensibly have pretty different life experiences, including, you know, white working class farmers, uh, black and brown warehouse workers who often travel from the south side of Chicago down I-55 to work in Will County, right? And then all of those folks coming together and saying, actually, we need a process for development that includes all of us and that really centers all of our needs. Uh, North Point has not officially been defeated yet, but they have been delayed for three and a half years, right? And even in those three and a half years, I'm just thinking about the level of diesel pollution that has been prevented from entering a community that again is already overburdened with um, huge air issues and public health crises. Um, and so I think that's really a model that we're still trying to figure out how to cross the finish line with, but I think it really shows that working class people all have a self-interest in sustainable development and figuring out how good jobs and green jobs can go hand in hand. So let's talk, because I think one of the things that happened in a lot of these, uh, kind of in all these conversations on every panel everywhere, right, is we kind of uh, excitedly get to be able to imagine and propose solutions using radical imagination, thinking about how the world could be otherwise. But I think achieving that world, right, the kind of practicalities of kind of getting there and the, 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 the ways that we can take on the machine, you know, make it, make it so seemingly so impossible. So I guess kind of the question that I want to have is um, not on here, but I know I'm, I'm, a, I'm a renegade. I just go off script all the time. I do what I want. I live my life. I'm an Aquarius. Um, but I guess one of the questions that I have is, you know, when we're thinking about how to make kind of actual change and what are the things that we can actually do and, and what are the ways to kind of have, bridge the gap between the reality that we're in and the one that our radical imagination wants to propose, right? Where are you seeing opportunities for change? Where are, what are the plans that you can see being executed? Um, and what are kind of the things that need to happen for uh, to bring that horizon closer to where we're at right now? So he's looking at me. Yeah, I, I would like that I start to go first. He's looking at me. <laughs> um, well, the first thing is it has to come from many fronts. It has it has to be tackled at many fronts, and so there's there's opportunity for everybody at every level to really be engaged in this struggle. In fact, we need to because the very thing the very things that are contaminating our communities are the things that are also uh, contaminating Mother Earth. Um, and those very things are what's going to make it impossible for us to exist as humans on this planet if we don't do something. Um, so the, the relationship between environmental justice and our survival uh, and climate justice you know, are really intertwined. Um, and there are people who engage in the struggle all over the world. We got the Glasgow uh, conference that's coming up. There's a lot of, there's an environmental justice delegation uh, from, from the United States and also from the Americas. It includes Indigenous Environmental Network, Just Transition Alliance, a whole slew of folks that are going to Glasgow. So they put themselves in those arenas where they can get certain language, they can get certain ideas, certain emphasis. Um, they're, they, they, they have a platform. They're, they, they intersect and, and communicate with a number of different leaders to try to influence you know, the agenda setting for, for such an inter important international event. And that's not the first one they've gone to. I mean, they've, they've went, they were in Paris, they were in Brazil uh, in the 90s, um, and they, they continue to show up at these international um, events. So that, that's, that's, you know, that, so, so that's one degree. But a lot of these same folks are also engaged um, in their own communities doing the kind of work, for example, that Abelham's doing. Um, and then, um, so, so, let me do let me do a quick plug if I can for a minute. Um, 
uh, for a, a panel that we're hosting with the, we're co-hosting with the Just Transition Alliance. And you guys, I, I'm, they're children here, so I'm gonna kind of say what I wanna say, but they're bad women, right? Um, and uh, these are women who ignited the environmental justice movement. There's six of them that'll be speaking. Um, and these are women who were at the original uh, environmental justice, uh, people of color environmental, uh, people of color environmental leadership summit in Washington D.C. October 25th through 27th in 1991. So we're commemorating 30 years of that. But but if you go to our website, you'll see it on the front page. But it includes Indigenous women, Asian Asian uh, women, uh, Mexicanas. Um, of African American women, it's a coalition of women, and these, and then we're also honoring women uh, who are also uh, part of this mo early movement, including Hazel Johnson, who's from Chicago. But um, but these are all the all the different mothers, right, and and, and, and who've been engaged in uh, environmental justice work now for, for more than thirty years, um, and have ignited the movement. So please come to that. It's October twenty second, twenty sixth, three to five, our time. Um, but so, and they will tell you, they'll talk, they'll answer that question about what they've been doing and uh, they come at it from a lot of different points of view. One of the things that was important since the kickoff in 1991 from that summit um, is, is the ways in which they also took on the federal government and EPA specifically. So they got Clinton, for example, to do uh, the, um, the um, executive order around environmental justice. That wasn't Clinton who said, hey, I'm going to do that. That came from grassroots activists going to Clinton saying we want this done and so one of the things that got established also was the National Environmental Justice Advisory Council uh, otherwise known as NEJAC and then from there a lot of whole different subcommittees and that committee still forms but that uh, has been another vehicle where they work with EPA um, they work with the Department of Justice so tackling people at the federal level one of the things that involves this, set, this set of kind of set of strategies that I'm talking about it involves them getting into the inside, you know, getting access to. I'm not necessarily being on the inside, but making their access to it. One of the, one of the, uh, for example, campaigns I was involved in uh, back in the 90s with uh, Environmental Justice Group was taking on intel around the contamination of work sites for the making of microchips. And it's like we sat down with with the heads of the corporations, right, and said, okay, this is what what the demands are. So that's one strategy. But as I think the alderman said, the, 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 all the, the protesting and all the sort of collective action on the outside really makes a difference when you're on the inside. Because it makes it easier for Byron, for alderman, for example, to advocate for something when he's got people on the outside who are, who are doing protesting. So the outside collective action is, and I think you said it too, Edith, it's like it's, it's part of the, it has to be done too. So that's what I mean by saying there's many strategies, many ways to address it, many angles, and there are a lot of people doing it. Finally, one of the things I want to also get in here is something about, the, about you heard me say the Just Transition Alliance. I want to say something about Just Transition. You know, uh, because uh, I mentioned something about, uh, about the, um, uh, uh, how they're always arguing, and they said this with the Hillco stuff too. They do it every time. Well, but look at all the jobs it's bringing, right? Oh, let's put up with the contamination that you're gonna get jobs. And one of the things that's really been important about the Warehouse Workers for Justice is like, yeah, but what kind of jobs, right? And then thinking then that, that, that Alvejo says, that, yeah, and at what cost, right? So one of the things that was done in the early 1990s is, um, or mid 1990s is, is, the, is the connection between the Oil Petrochemical Workers Union um, and which has morphed uh, over time their connection, they connected with, or an environmental justice networks connected with them and formed something called the Just Transition Alliance, which was, because one of the things, for example, that, that uh, one of the key leaders out of the justice transition on the labor side would say is, look, the stuff that we're making in these, in these factories, they shouldn't be made, they shouldn't be on the face of the planet, right? So now, and then our workers are being exposed to this stuff. So one of the things they did is they brought the worker perspective together with the with the, uh, uh, the the community perspective and form the environment form the just transition alliance so that when we talk about just transition if we're unless we're talking about labor and workers as part of that conversation then we're really not talking about the just transition 
Um, and then finally, on the point around the green technology, you know, one of the things we've done is we've advocated for uh, inclusion in the manufacturing sector. There's a big labor shortage. There's all kinds of changes happening in advanced manufacturing, not the smokestack stuff. But there's a lot of possibilities, right? And we're in coalition with some folks uh, on a ma inclusion, inclusionary man inclusion in manufacturing campaign. Uh, we've got some federal le legislation uh, that's out there right now. But one of the things um, that um, um, that's, that's important about the manufacturing for in relation to all of this, we should be doing more manufacturing of the green technology that's needed for us to make the transition away from fossil fuels. We've got to make that transition away from fossil fuels. And so um, even some of the work we're doing with Freshland Water Labs, Great Cities is part with Freshland Water Labs on, uh, de on actually designing some, with, we have engineers obviously on the, on the team, on designing some uh, some infrastructure that's going to be um, that's going to not do all the negative things, right? That's actually going to address um, s some of these contamination issues and provide alternatives. Because you're seeing now, I just filled up my tank because I'm getting ready to drive down to Southern Illinois, or Central Illinois. I can't, it cost me sixty-seven dollars, and my tank isn't even that big. I'm like, oh my god, four dollars and what a gallon? Well, part of why that's happening is because there's a shortage of of oil and part of the, the shortage, there's a whole slew of reasons. But what's important now is we not say, okay, well, let's hurry up and pump more. It's like, no, let's hurry up and move, that, move to renewables and build the infrastructure for renewables. We can't go back to, we can't become uh, dependent again on oil. We've got to move away. So I think all these things are intertwined, which is why I think there's room for everybody at multiple levels. And the more we think about how they're all connected, the better we can be in coalition with one another to beat this thing, because our very survival uh, on this planet depends on it. I have an idea that it, for to get rid of like plastic water bottles, I want <laughs> Great alternative, good save. Byron, how are we saving the world? Talk to us. Well, I think, I think there is a uh, kind of... Uh, no, 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 no. Come up with your answer. <laughs> I want to follow up on what... Or build up on what you said. But it was... Uh, it, it is critical that we take this, this uh, global crisis with the urgency that the needs, right? I think that we are called to take action. Uh, I think this is a call for action and involvement and understanding of what's at stake. I think that what we see was possible... Uh, I think, you know, to me, you know, this being the, the issue of, of pollution in particular was not something that came um, uh, naturally. But they are actually the intersections between what's happening now with Steve Donsinger in New York and the, um, the uh, lack of accountability and the atrocities that the oil fusil, uh, fossil industry has committed for a long time didn't come at, uh, as clear at first. As someone growing up in a, such a... Um, in a neoliberal reality that was full with the oil industry running the government, it didn't really come clear because you have a cold infrastructure uh, that denies the truth in a time where we need to see with clarity was at stake. Uh, I think, you know, Malcolm X said it very well. I think if we don't look at reality and look at information the way we have and which we should have, uh, we ended up praising those who are pressing us and denying or, or attacking those who are trying to help us. I think that that is that is a reality today uh, when we see uh, the you know corporate interests controlling the media, controlling institutions. We rely on people. We rely on the working class, seeing the intersectionality between different communities, seeing the inter intersectionalities on both sides of the borders. And I think it's critical for us to look deep in what's possible. Uh, my wife, you know, had the you know uh, Lorraine, which is a public health expert, uh, an expert really put it very simple for me when we were talking. Uh, when we see communities, you know, she grew up, you know, on uh, uh, close to Niles, the, the Niles Township, and I think that when we see uh, the equality in, in a community like that, when we see the quality of education, what we see was possible. 
We have to dare to see why we cannot have the same thing in other communities. Why the inequality? Why we can and why we accept that as a norm? We got to challenge this in every aspect uh, of, of life. We have to look it on the ground. If you're an organizer, if you're a public representative, if you're a researcher, if you live in Mexico or you live here, I think that we need to make sure that we connect the dots and we are in solidarity with the movement for social justice, for environmental justice, for our very survival. I think that the call for action is an urgent call for elected op officials to see what's at stake for very survival. And again, I, I think that we got a point at the systemic racism, the systemic inequality, and the systems that are in place right now that oppress us. Capitalism, what we see what's happening with Facebook, what we see what's happening uh, in, in, in different parts of the country, we see the fires in California, what we see the flooding in New Orleans. What else, do we, what else are we waiting for to take action? I think that's the call for all of us. What else that needs to happen to realize that we are in, in, in a time if, that we, we don't take action, no one else will. Corporations certainly won't. Uh, the billionaires are more interested in going to Mars than actually treating the workers with respect and dignity. And the audacity of those billionaires and corporations must be matched with our audacity to dream big and our audacity to, to make sure that we all are treated with dignity and respect. And it's not something that comes naturally easily when we have a campaign of misinformation by the same corporations and billionaires. I do think, I'm, I'm going back to one, uh, what was said uh, by Yana, we need to tax Amazon. We need to tax these corporations. We need to tax billionaires. And we don't need to tax them uh, to what they're willing to do. We need to tax them what is historically possible. In the times of, of the, the, the New Deal, we talk about rates of, that are beyond 50%. And I think that's what's possible and it's necessary for us to be, comp to be uh, like you said, not a cliche of sustainability, but real, a Green New Deal is within reach and not without a compromise. We cannot compromise on the well-being and survival of our communities. We need to take bold and, and decisive action now and today to protect the planet, which is to, to protect ourselves. Byron, I think one of the questions I have is like, let's give Byron a round of applause. He loves it. He loves it. Um, but I think one of the other things I want to talk about, though, is frequently we say this like phrase of like taxing the rich, taxing the rich, right? And while I uh, understand the sentiment and I believe it, it is necessary, what do we do in a city like Chicago or in a country like the United Na uh, States where so much of the federal discretionary funding that is garnered through um, and, and, and mass through taxes go to things like the military or $1.8 billion to police? So how do we? How can we make those demands for you know taxing the rich? Also, like what are the ways to kind of expand it to um, also have a stake in where that money goes? Yes, and, and that's what I, that's what I know. I, yes, I said it. I'm, I'm <laughs> and I think you said it. <laughs> you said it well. But that's what is very important. I think right now, and that's what that's it is important to really protect our future, protect our kids, and really. Uh, it's really sad we see what's happening right now as we see politicians and, and talking about uh, the, the vaccination and, and the mandates and all that. But we see what's happening is tragic when we see kids, literally over 200 kids have been killed in the city of Chicago just this year. I do think it is critical for us to make sure that we have a call for all our, our community to be part of government, to be part of elected officials. We gotta inspire our young people to take government and to take it back from the hands of corporations and developers who dictate what's possible. I think that we should be able to have public officials that really represent the voices of our community and when they don't, we gotta take them out of office so that we have real representatives and we can have the majorities that are needed. So I think that there's very concerted effort and I think that it's been a campaign by the Koch brothers, corporations, to invest in our public schools, to disinvest in them, to, to, to change curriculums, to make sure that we are not paying attention to what's happening right now in front of us. I think it's critical that we empower, that we uplift, that we motivate our indigenous communities, that we com that our most oppressive communities to be part of this uh, of this change. We cannot accept uh, the narrative that oh, we cannot get involved because it's too corrupt, it's too dirty. It is, and we're not going to change it unless we have our communities organized to take over and make sure the government represents us, not the special interest groups. I think that there's a concerted effort, and I think we saw it very in extreme cases when we have. Uh, elected officials which are more interested in dismantling the EPA instead of investing in the EPA. Those decisions make a difference. Having an agency that represents us versus having an agency that is, uh, that is on the border of collapse. Having government that represents us is important as well as organizing and many other things. There's room for everything. And again, one more thing I'd like to say. Judges are also elected, elected by the public. So we also got to look at every aspect 
from the judicial, the legislative, the, the executive branch, everywhere in the communities and beyond, we have to make a movement for resistance. And finally, what I have to say, that one is out there. Oh, you said one more thing and now you're going. We let me just, that's enough. Let me just finish because this is Hurry, important. Let's do it. I do think that it is critical that we look at, at what I will see in other parts of the world. I would like to really uh, see how uh, demonize certain movements are, are, are done. I didn't really want to recognize the leadership and the visionary um, uh, movement of the Zapatistas in Mexico. It is very important that we discuss that because they were calling neoliberalism, the supply chain problems that we have, the fossil industries uh, collapsing back in the 90s when the government tried to repress them and oppress them and silence them. Those places of resistance have created more sustainable models that need to be replicated, not brutalized, not, not, not to meet with surveillance. These places look very different wherever we are, but we need to look at those resistance places, democratic spaces in our own communities. Those visions are only possible with real democracy and real participation. So I just don't want to forget about that because it's important that we stop demonizing those who are trying to help us and really demonizing those fuels, fossil fuel industry, millionaires and corporations that are really damaging our communities. I also think yeah, okay, give him a round of applause. Um, but I also, also, also think we need to stop demonizing billionaires going to space. I would like all of them to go to space. Um, Stay there. In fact, the Hood Wazi is launching a GoFundMe next week to raise money to send Lori Lightfoot to space. What way trip for? You can check on our Facebook and our Instagram. We will be raising a billion dollars, however much it costs, to send Lori to uh, space. Please contribute. I'm serious. <laughs> Look out for it. It'll be there. Lori 2022 on the moon. moon. <laughs> Bring in the light to the cosmos. Um, and, uh, so we got. We're, we we have to uh, wrap it up. But uh, Yana and Edith, can you take us home with uh, you know to carrying on this conversation? Yeah, take as much time as you need. I don't know how to say. Um, yeah, I think uh, it what is the question how do, how do we change the world? <laughs> okay, Essentially, great. yeah. Perfect. Um, yeah, I think, okay, I'm going to start off by saying that the left is probably too critical of the left, and I'm going to be very critical of the left. Okay, great. So I, I come out of labor, right? I don't come out of the environmental movement, and actually I've had to do a lot of learning around environmental justice and uh, climate change in this role. Um, and also I am not going to tell you how old I am. I'm in my 20s, though, early 20s. Um, and I'm really concerned about having a place to live in a couple of decades, right? Um, but I felt really isolated from the environmental movement growing up because while a lot of the faces looked a lot like mine, right, but I think the things that they were talking about didn't resonate with the experience I had growing up as a child of working class immigrants, and specifically when they approached uh, questions about dirty industries, which my dad happened to work in, uh, with the response that, you know, Closing those industries is important enough that it doesn't matter what it happens to the workers working in those industries, right? And I think that kind of uh, mainstream environmental dialogue is really, really harmful and kind of perpetuates the, the really wide divisions that sometimes exist between labor and environmental groups. And also why I'm super grateful to work with dope environmental groups like El Vejo that are doing the work very differently, right? Um, and then on the labor side's perspective, I think labor does a lot of the same things where they are, you know, in modern days kind of moving closer to uh, having dialogue around green jobs because they're interested in the tax incentives that come with that. They're not actually acknowledging the environmental injustice and the history of environmental racism that impacts primarily low-wage workers of color who have also historically been excluded from labor, from unions, right? And so how do we address both of those things? And I think one of the ways we do that is really placing low-wage black and brown workers in the in the driving seat, right? Uh, alongside with indigenous communities who have really sustainable models that we came in with capitalism and messed up, right? Um, and how do we kind of put all those folks in the driving seat to create solutions to admittedly problems that they're least responsible for causing, right? And alongside the same track, which is not something that I work on in my job, right? But it's something that I ask about as a person <laughs> is okay the labor movement and the environment's movement have all these problems strengths weaknesses etc but i think an issue that both share pretty deeply is that both of those movements in the united states are very 
America focused, right? And so how do we address exploitation in the global south, and especially as we think about the Green New Deal as a potential solution to all of these complicated problems? The Green New Deal in its current form still relies very deeply on exploitation of labor and natural resources in the global south to you know, save American capitalism uh, in a way that's not actually addressing the climate crisis in an effective way, right? Because even if our air is perfectly clean right here, even if we have access to water right here, uh, we all share a planet and we all share resources and borders are artificial, right? And so how do we think about ways to respond to all of those things on a global scale is also really important. Yes, yeah, that is my new favorite white person. <laughs> Oh, come on. Yeah, that was actually brilliant. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, yeah, I would say also calling in a lot of the community institutions that are supporting a lot of the um, supposedly um, industries, right, that are bringing in opportunities. For example, in Little Village, we have the Little Village Chamber of Commerce, who has been very adamant in supporting uh, Hilco and, you know, bringing this corporation into our community and only offering 2,000 jobs, right? As a Chamber of Commerce that is supposed to be supporting small businesses, why are they even involved in supporting our The fake Little Village Chamber of Commerce, and I hope you hear me on 20... 6th in Sacramento, wherever you are. I got your <laughs> Yeah, I mean, like, why? They're supposed to be supporting small businesses, right? right. Little Village is known for its mom and pop shops, uh, you know, the entrepreneurial spirit. So why are they messing with a multi-billion dollar corporation? Why? They, they don't have they to. They fake Little Village Chamber of <laughs> Commerce. They don't have to, right? And so in calling them in, right, and asking and, and letting them know that first, Residents, um, they know what you are doing. They are very much aware of who are you supporting and who are you being vocal with. Um, yeah, you know, things are gonna happen. I don't know what's gonna happen, but the Little Village Chamber of Commerce, you know, they have been doing this for quite a number of years. And then also to have um, Rodriguez Media Inc. or Rodriguez Communications Inc., which is Eve Rodriguez, who is a paid lobbyist, right, of, Hilco Redevelopment Partners, they are very much involved with the Little Village Chamber They're of Commerce. They're also the owners of Dulcelandia? Yes, they are also the owners of Dulcelandia. So, I mean, even we have a lot of, you know, um, community institutions that are seeing Hilco as like the, the savior of all, but in reality, right, it's like the smaller businesses, they're the, they're the reason why we even are considered the second, you know, that bring in the second largest tax revenue to the city of Chicago. And so utilizing this time to also plug, right, that we are connecting and we are trying to work with uh, warehouse workers at the Exchange 55 uh, warehouse facility. These are again, target uh, warehouse workers that just started um, at this warehouse. So if any of you know um, any uh, new employees, let them know that El Vejo um, is uh, trying to connect with them and trying to organize with them. I'm also doing a plug, um, El Bejo has a table here and so we're, t uh, we're serving um, the water and health of our area. So we're asking residents that live um, in Little Village uh, with the zip code 2308 um, to take our survey. We want to know um, what is uh, the water quality um, in your building. Do y'all get flooding? Um, we are working with uh, CMT to uh, figure out um, these uh, issues and trying to come up with solutions as well. Um, so meet us up, we're here. Um, big shout out to our Just Transition and Water Justice teams that are here. Um, yeah, thanks. <laughs> You want to add very briefly, right? Just very briefly. I want to lift, very briefly. I want to lift up something that Yana said, which I think is really important. This uh, and this whole idea around around the relationship between workers and environmental justice movement versus workers and the environmental movement. I think the whole concept. Well, not I think. I know that the whole concept of the just transition is the idea that as we move away from fossil fuels, as we move away from from those contaminating kinds of industries and workplaces that we deal with, that we are sensitive to, we pay attention to we, we the workers uh, who are impacted by that, right? And how you make sure that those workers then are part of the new economy, because that's part of what happened even with the Indian industrialization, right? It's like workers just got left behind. So that, you know, the, that connection, right? And, which, and this whole relationship to the mainstream environmental movement is something else that I thought Yana said that's really important, because part of why, part of the, the 
why environmental justice activists go to Glasgow, for example, is to make sure that certain issues get raised that otherwise would not. And so the EJ movement, they talk a lot about false solutions that are being proposed by the environmental, mainstream environmental uh, uh, movement or mainstream environmentalists, right? And they call them false solutions because they might be a solution, but they're usually off the back of communities of color. So I'm really glad you brought that up, Donna, and I want to just say it's really great to be on the panel with you all. Oh, and don't forget our event, please, on, <laughs> on, on October 26th, because the women that you're going to hear on that panel is just going to blow you away. I'm going to go, it's October 26th by Halloween, I'm going to go in costume. I want to be a sexy revolutionary, so I'm just going to have a beret and a thong on. Um, it's a Zoom event, we'll only get to see the beret, unless he stands up. Oh. I will have my video on, but I will be muted. <laughs> um, so I just want to thank everyone for coming out. I want to give a big round of applause to our panelists. If you want to uh, keep up with their work, you can look at this thing called Google. You type in their name, stuff will come up, you can follow them through there. Um, I also want to welcome everyone back to the stage at... Oh, uh, in about 10 minutes at 1.35, we'll be um, starting our next conversation with arts activists that are taking on um, the intersection of arts and environment. And also want to announce um, a, the Shy Environmental Educator Workshop that is happening right now at 1.15 uh, over there by the water. Um, go ahead and take a 10 minute break, come back.